Well, good morning, church. We are so thankful that you came once again to our virtual worship service, and we are excited about worshiping the Lord. How many of you are are getting used to us meeting uh, live stream? How many of you are getting used to sitting on your couch or in your bedroom or wherever you sit and and singing together and listening to the word? Uh, how many of you are getting comfortable with that? How many of you would vote right now, vote if you would rather do vote for this than come and worship here publicly together? Would any of you vote for that? I don't see any hands raised, so... Uh, all right, I can only assume that we are, we're looking forward to worshiping together, and as a matter of prayer, later on here in just a couple minutes, we're going to pray for our leaders that they will have God's discernment and wisdom on when to start loosening some of these restrictions, and so that we can come together again and worship the Lord. But in the meantime, we are going to worship the Lord and honor him. And I wanted to just refer to a passage of scripture as we begin our worship service today in Nehemiah chapter eight. And as we look at Nehemiah, what we are gonna see here is some some powerful things. The, the nation of Israel had been taken captive for a long time and they hadn't had an opportunity to worship the Lord in, in Jerusalem and in the temple. And so in Nehemiah, the account is of them coming back, rebuilding the wall, and then gathering together to hear the word of the Lord preached, to be able to sing praises and to bow down before the Lord. And I I want to read Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 5 and 6, and then also verse 10 as we begin today. It says in verse 5, Ezra stood at the platform in full view of all people. When they saw him open the book, they all rose to their feet. Then Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people chanted, Amen, Amen, as they lifted their hands, and they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Then Ezra said this, or Nehemiah said this to the people, This is a sacred day before our Lord. Don't be dejected and sad, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. No matter where we're at, no matter if we're sort of frustrated about not gathering, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And I pray that we can gather together in spirit again today and worship the Lord. Holy is the Lord. Sing with us, would you? Holy is the Lord. 
are so thankful for this amazing reminder that wherever we look, wherever we go, whatever we face in life, God, your glory is revealed. Lord, help us to not be blinded to it. Help us to not be distracted from it, but that we with one voice as followers of Jesus, that we would give you the glory that you alone deserve. And Lord, we praise you that you've created us for such a thing as this. We ask that you would lead us and direct us and teach us and encourage us through this time together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, before we continue with some singing today, I want to just uh, highlight a few things that you can be reminded of. We have a few announcements, and again, if you're not receiving those announcements, just make sure that you get a hold of us here at the church or come by. Give us your email. We send it out in email form, and uh, that, that in mind to keep you up to date with announcements and prayer requests, and so keep that in mind. We would love to hear from you if there's things we can be praying for you about. Some of you do communicate in those ways, and, and we would love to be able to communicate that to the rest of the church family as well. For a few announcements this week, uh, we have one specific that I want to draw your attention to. Some of you know that we are going to have a worship night here at the church this this Thursday. Now, you can't come here, obviously, but join us online, and Amanda Whitney and Caroline Jared are going to do a worship night, and it's going to begin at 7 o'clock on Facebook, and it's Facebook Live, and so you just go to uh, Amanda Whitney's account, and you can see it there. Uh, Northwest Community Church is going to do a watch party as well, so one of the ways you can, if you have Facebook, you can log in and, and watch that, and so I'd encourage you to do that. They are taking requests, and so we sent out a link for you to click on, and some of you have sent in uh, different songs to request that they sing. Uh, some of you have sent in a lot of songs to sing. Some of you have actually sent in songs that are um, probably not going to be sung. Um, some, somebody asked if there could be uh, the Beatles uh, singing a, a song, and so I don't know that they're going to do that. Okay. Okay, so this is new information. You don't even have to have Facebook to watch this on, on Thursday night. So we will put a link on the church website as well that you can click on and then be able to view this worship night on Thursday. So no matter what, you're going to have an opportunity to do that. Again, no Beatles requests. Other than that, we're good to go. So Let's uh, continue um, with uh, some other, other things real quick that we can just remind you of. We had uh, a, a crazy uh, thing happen here a couple days ago, on, and he, Friday, uh, we heard that Brody Draper uh, fell and hit his head very hard, and he was unconscious for at least a minute, and uh, so it was a very scary time for Chad and Cassandra, and, um, but as we were praying for him, many of you heard of that prayer request, praying for him, going to the ER and getting a CAT scan and all those things that go along with it. He is at home. He is resting. He is doing good. So we praise God for that answer to prayer. Continue to pray for him as he recovers. Um, but he did have a very bad concussion. And so just pray that everything goes well and that um, his brain can um, heal and that there isn't any complications from that. So continue to pray for Brody and the rest of the, the Draper fam family as well. Remember to pray for our leaders. As I said, let's pray that the president and, and all those that are making these decisions for our country and then the governors and the mayors and the local leadership, that they would have God's wisdom on when to uh, loosen up some of these restrictions. And let's pray that it is sooner than later. We want to be safe, but we also want to uh, be wise and discerning and not be um, overreactionary, and we want to gather again. We want to see your faces, and so join with me in praying for our leaders and that they would make the decisions that the Lord is leading them to make. And remember to pray for each other. I know so, so many of you are praying for one another. You're checking in. I just want to tell all of you how much I appreciate just the body of Christ functioning so well together through texting and communicating. You guys are doing so well at checking in on each other and praying for one another, going to the store for each other, and that is how the body functions together. And so remember to pray for one another and that we would 
just be strengthened, that we would be safe, that we would be healthy, and that our spiritual walk with the Lord would increase during uh, this time. So keep praying for one another. I'm going to pray right now. So would you just join me and let's, let's go to the Lord. Father, we thank you for our time together today. We just praise you, God, that you are a good and faithful God. We thank you for the example of just protecting Brody. He's at home and in his head. God, we thank you that it wasn't worse. We just praise you that um, he's at home and resting. We pray that you would just heal his head and that there wouldn't be any complications. Father, we're just a reminder that we are not in control of this life. And so we trust you for all of the ups and downs that you are faithful and you remain the same. Father, I pray for our leaders. God, would you work and move in their hearts? Would you give them your wisdom? And God, would you cause them to seek you that they would put their knees their knees to the ground and their face down before you and that they would worship you. And God, that you would give them your wisdom. Lead them, God, to make these decisions that would be a benefit to our country and to the world as a whole, that you would be in charge, God. We thank you for our leaders. Lord, we just pray that you would be at work in each of our lives today, that you would draw us close to yourself, that we would be growing spiritually, that we would be staying healthy, that we'd be looking for ways to minister to one another in this community. And God, we thank you for you doing that in each of our lives. So direct us now as we continue our worship. May it be honoring to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This next song that we're going to sing is O Glorious Day, and it ties in so well with coming off of a Resurrection Sunday last week and thinking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as we sing this song, every day should be a resurrection day. It should be a day that is celebrated of new life in Christ. This is who we are. I want you to think about the words, the lyrics to this song. There is such profound theology about what it means to be saved, what it means, what Jesus did for us on the cross, what it means to be justified, to, to be born again to new life. Think about the truths, the realities that are sung in this song as we worship together. One day with Jesus came forth to 
today we're going to look at a, a different passage of Scripture that maybe we haven't looked at for a while. And so I want to uh, ask you to take your Bibles and turn to uh, back to the, the back of your Bible to 2 Peter chapter 3. And over the next two weeks, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 14. 2 Peter 3, verses 1 through 14, and, and you'll see there um, in the notes that, uh, that I think we emailed out to, to most of you, and if not, just understand the next couple that we're, we're going to touch on some end time stuff for a little bit over these next couple of weeks. And where we actually go, um, I think, honestly, on a, the, the Lord is the only one that knows that truly, but uh, my intention is to talk about this subject of the end times and the last days. Um, I've had a number of questions from different people. I've had different conversations with uh, those that are, are wanting to know more about the last days and the end times and what do these times look like and are we living in the last days. And um, there's a lot of, lot of questions out there, especially when, when things aren't normal and we're living in a time where there's a little bit of upheaval and the people are getting sick and dying with the pandemic. And this is just one little thing of, of we look at history as a whole, how many times historically the, the human race has gone through periods like this and much more severe and greater than that. And so, but nonetheless, when there's difficulties in our world and trials and tribulations, people naturally want to think about prophecies and end time stuff, especially those that know the Lord and believe that, that there will be a time when the Lord does bring a final judgment and returns for His followers. And so the questions have been asked at different times um, here recently especially, are we living in the last days? Uh, when will the Lord return? Um, will the rapture of the church be uh, happening soon? Will it be prior to the seven-year tribulation or in the middle or at the end? Or, or is it going to happen at all? And so all these questions, uh, there are some answers that we see very clearly in God's Word, and I want to touch on those uh, today and next week. And, and some uh, as we ask these questions, a few answers to the in God's Word and some aren't clear. And so sometimes people have answers and they give you answers to these questions. And depending on who they are and how much they, they know about God's Word and how much they take God at His Word, sometimes their um, answers to these questions may be accurate and sadly, sometimes they are not accurate. And sometimes they're just not knowable. We don't know all the details of the end times, but the things that God did want us to know, He has revealed to us, and that's what we want to cover uh, today and next week. But understand that my intention of covering living in the end times is not so much just to answer questions about prophecies and the fulfillment of them and what God's plan for the future may be, but how are we to respond and live in the end times? in the last days. We are living right now in the last days. Now you say, well, how do I know that? Because the last days is not just a very small window in time, but a broader grouping of time where God is working in the hearts of men and He's drawing people to Himself in this age of the church. It is a period of what now is almost 2,000 years, and it is uh, when the church began, we see that the reference was that they were living in the last days, and so we are too. We're living in the last days of, of God's final summation of what He is going to do before He brings about judgment. Now, I'm not going to get into the, the timing of that and, and how I can prove that, but just understand that, that according to God's Word, we are living in the last days. Could we be here another hundred years or another thousand years? Yes, but we're still living in the end times. The question is, what kind of people should we be? And so I want us to be challenged by this this morning. What kind of people should we be? Well, very simply, we need to understand and connect to this one truth. We'll see woven throughout these 14 verses. Followers of Jesus must not be lulled to sleep, 
but awakened in these last days to live with eternal priorities. And so are we. If you're a follower of Christ, are you being lulled to sleep, not focused on the things that really matter, But as followers of Jesus, we should be awakened in these last days to live with eternal priorities. Would you just look at 2 Peter 3, verses 1 through 14. Follow along, and I'm going to read these verses, and this will set the stage for what we want to talk about today and then next Sunday. Starting in verse 1, this is my second letter to you, dear friends. And in both of them, I have tried to stimulate your wholesome thinking and refresh your memory. I want you to remember what the Holy Prophet said long ago and what our Lord and Savior commanded through apostles, through your apostles. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. They deliberately forget that God made the heavens by the word of His command, and He brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water. Then He used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire." They are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. Verse 8. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about His promise as some people want to be destroyed. No, He is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to. To repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire. And the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Verse 11 Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live, looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, He will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and new earth. He has promised a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while we are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in His sight. Would you join me in praying? Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. And we ask in these moments that you would have the freedom to work in our hearts, that we wouldn't be distracted or hardened, but that we would be ready to receive the good word and that our hearts would be good soil that you can plant your word in and that you would produce great results, great fruit, your work in us, God. Help us to see that in these last days you have called us to to live lives that honor you, to reflect your glory, to keep our eyes on you, and to live peaceful lives that are pure and right before you. God, help us to be aware and to know that there is a people that don't know you and they need to hear that you are going to come back to help us, that you will judge sin. And I pray, God, that you would help us to clearly communicate to these people so that they could know that they can be cleansed and forgiven and escape that judgment through faith in Christ. God, do a work in us and, and, and through us as a church family over these next couple of weeks. Help us to to live the way that you want us to in these end times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today as we think about this subject, as we think about living in the end times and the challenge for all of us as followers of Jesus to not be lulled to sleep, but awakened in these last days to 
live with eternal priorities. I want us to focus and think about what I think in these verses um, reveals three very specific eternal priorities that we should have, that we should be pursuing and allowing to be a part of our life every day. Three priorities. Let me just mention them briefly, and then we'll get into them in more detail. In verses 1 through 7, the first priority that we're going to talk about is that we should wake up, not waste our time. That should be a priority of our lives, to wake up and not waste our time. Secondly, we should warn of God's work and not be weary. That should be a priority of our life, is to warn people that God is going to do a great work and He is going to judge, but in this, in before this judgment, He is patient. And so we shouldn't grow weary either, but be patient, waiting on God to do what He wants to do. And then thirdly, and we're going to cover this next week, Thirdly, the third priority is that we should walk close to the Lord and not wander. So over the next two weeks, we will cover those three priorities. So I want us to go back and look at verses 1 through 7 now. And and instead of being lulled to sleep, what should our first priority be? It should be that we should wake up, not waste our time. How many of us are wasting our time? How many of us go from day to day? At the end of the day, we look back on the day and we reflect on, well, what did I do today? And sometimes we are embarrassed and we wouldn't want to announce it on Facebook what we did today. What, you know, no one should know that, well, I pretty much did nothing. I just sat in my pajamas. I didn't even comb my hair or brush my teeth and I didn't do anything. Are we wasting our time? Well, as believers, we shouldn't be wasting our time. We should wake up. And, and I love this passage because... This is exactly what Peter is is calling the the believers in the church to do here. We should wake up and not waste our time. Why? Well, he gives us the reason why we should wake up in verses 1 and 2. First of all, to think straight. We wake up so that we can think straight, so that we can have a clear head. Notice what he says. This is my second letter to you, dear friends, and in both of them I have tried, notice this, to stimulate your wholesome thinking. To stimulate, so that's a, the, the word there is to motivate, to light a fire, to get going, to cause someone to move from the, the stationary position of standing still and to get the inertia going and to move. We need to wake up. Sometimes in the morning, Anika will get up before me and she will turn on the coffee pot and then she makes a pot of coffee and I can smell the coffee. Now, I said sometimes because it doesn't always happen that way. It's usually the reverse where I get up before she does. But I love it when I can wake up and smell coffee. And um, most of you know that I do enjoy um, a number of cups of coffee. But that coffee one of the purposes that it serves is the smell and the aroma and the flavor and then, of course, the, just the, the stimulant of the caffeine that it is. It, it motivates. It stimulates. And Peter is calling us to, to be motivated. The danger here, God knows. Our, I think the Holy Spirit led Peter to write this because he knows, God knows our hearts as believers that if we've grown up in the church and if we have grown in our walk with the Lord and we know the Sunday school stories and we know the churchy words and, and we know the theologies and we know the doctrines and we know about this and that, sometimes we grow so familiar to the truths of God's Word that we forget their intended purpose. See, the intended purpose of knowing the truths of God's Word is not to know the truths of God's Word. And let me just say very bluntly, I think that there are many people, including myself at times, that have been caught up in just knowing God's Word. And I know more than you, and my head is really, really, really big. I know so much. Well, so what? If we forget the intended purpose of the truth of God's Word. The truth of God's Word is not just to know it, but to apply it and let it be lived out in our lives, to let it change us, to direct us, to correct us, and to protect us. If we're not remembering the importance of God's Word, then we're missing the whole point. And Peter is saying here, I want to stimulate you. I want to waken you up. And notice what he says, 
to stimulate your wholesome thinking. And so the wholesome thinking is thinking correctly, biblically about God's Word. You need to remember what you have learned in Sunday school. You need to remember what God has said because God's Word directs, it protects, it corrects. It helps us not to be complacent and, and in a sense, to, to stop being spiritual couch potatoes. And so notice he is calling us to remember the truth of God's Word, and he says, refresh your memory. I want you to remember. So he's calling us to bring to mind what we know to be true. And, and in fact, you go back into chapter 1 for a moment. Notice what it says in chapter 1, verse 12. There are these things always remind you. So the, here's this theme again. Peter is reminding them about these things, even though you already know them and are standing firm in the truth you've been taught. So Peter's saying, just because you know them doesn't mean that I'm not going to remind you of them again. I know some of you, you get, you get tired. I can see it on your face. Sometimes you may roll your eyes. You, you get tired of me repeating things. Well, what I have learned is that I don't remember things very well unless they're repeated to me. And so I'm just, I just draw that conclusion that unless we hear things over and over again, sometimes we as human beings forget. And so Peter understood this as well. And so he repeated them, those truths, to think biblically and to remember what was true. Notice now in verse 2 of chapter 3, I want you to remember what the holy prophets said long ago, what our Lord and Savior commanded through your apostles. So, in this context here, and we'll get into the context more in, in these later verses, but we already read it, you saw that the context is how are we to live in the last days, in the end times. And, and so, the, the reference in verse 10 is, the, is really the, the point of this passage. How should we live because the day of the Lord is coming? How should we respond to that reality? And Peter is saying, back in verse 2, we need to remember that the apostles didn't fabricate the truth about the day of the Lord. They taught about the day of the Lord, and it wasn't made up. It was a truth that they were taught by Jesus Christ Himself. And that even the Old Testament prophets taught about the day of the Lord. So we need to remember not only the, the truth of God's Word as a whole and all the teachings in it, but specifically here in this passage, that the day of the Lord will come. We need to wake up to this reality so that we can think straight, that we can think clearly. So why do we need to wake up and not waste our time? Not just to think straight, but notice verses 3 and 4. We need to, we need to do this because truth is going to be mocked. Notice what it says in verses 3 and 4. Most assuredly, I want to remind you, there Peter is again, telling them something they already know. I want to remind you that in these last days, scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promises about Jesus coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. I have heard unbelievers say this. I have heard them mocking and scoffing. You know what? I have even heard believers say those very words. Well, he hasn't come back yet. We've been doing the same thing year after year. I wonder if the Lord is ever going to return. Maybe, maybe we're wrong in our, our theology, our eschatology about end times prophecies. God's word is God's word and what he said is true. But yet the unbelievers... And even, sadly, some of us will get sucked into this at times. We will mock, they will mock the truth. Truth is mocked. So we need to wake up because there are scoffers in these last days. Again, these last days, notice what it says there, that phrase. I want to remind you that in the last days, that phrase is a term describing not a short period of time, but the time prior to God's final judgment on sin. You need to understand that because, because when we say we're living in the last days, that doesn't mean that it started in you know, 2001 and it'll end in 2025. It's not a, a small window of time, the last days, but it is a period of God working 
prior. He's getting things prepared and drawing people to himself and spreading the gospel and using the body of Christ, the church, to tell others, go into all the world and preach the gospel so that people can come to him by faith so that they can be redeemed and made righteous and live with him forever in eternity before the last days is over and his judgment, the day of the Lord, comes. So, in the meantime, this truth is mocked. Notice these scoffers, these mockers, there in verse 3. Scoffers will come mocking the truth, and notice what they do. They, they, they mock the truth and they follow their own desires. You know, this starts to hit close to home, doesn't it? Because sometimes we will find ourselves in this category of being a scoffer. We, we mock the truth at times, depending on what it is. And we instead follow our own desires. What are our own desires? Well, it's the here and now. It's the appetites of the flesh. It's those things that are more important to me than God's plans and promises. And so I'm thinking about me and what's going to suffice and satisfy my life and the pleasures that I want to be a part of. And, and so that is the mindset of the scoffer. Are we there? Do we find ourselves there? We should definitely not be included in this, and yet I think sometimes we are. We're wasting our time, and we need to wake up to think clearly and to not mock the truth. But the truth will be mocked at times. So they say specifically, what happened to the promise? Nothing has changed. Jesus hasn't come back. And we need to be careful that that is not our attitude. Uh, some of you, when you read this passage about scoffers mocking the truth and, and calling out Christians for what they believe about end times, um, you're reminded of a passage in 2 Timothy, and I want you to go there and, and notice the first five verses of 2 Timothy 3. It said, You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days selves, and there will be very difficult times, for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred, they will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. And Peter warns, or Paul warns Timothy to stay away from people like that. And we are warned as well. When you read a passage like that, you say, that was written in the early church in the first century. And, and Paul is saying they were living in the last days. And here we are almost 2,000 years later, still saying the same thing. And the same things that Paul and Timothy saw happening in, in the society around them is still happening today. People that don't know the Lord are going to act that way. And so it is our job to be aware of that and to not get sucked into that and to not follow suit by doing things and living a life of worldliness. But instead, we should wake up and not waste our time. Why? Because verses 5 through 7 clearly say that judgment has happened before and it's going to happen again. So we need to wake up. Notice what it says there in verse 5. They will deliberately forget what God made that God made the heavens by the word of His command and brought the earth out of the water and He surrounded it with water and He used that water to destroy the ancient world, referring to the flood. And you go back in, in uh, Peter's teachings and his epistles and he refers to, to that time very specifically about God's judgment in the days of Noah. And in the same way that God judged the, the, the earth and the people on the earth, judged people a great flood of water... God is at one time in the future going to judge people again, but not with, fire, uh, not with water, but with fire, as it says there in verse 7. The point is that God is going to judge again. Just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean that it's not going to happen again. God has done it before, and He has promised to do it again. So, what is our response? 
We should be sober. We should have a reality check. We should wake up and not waste our time because the time is getting short when God is going to once again judge the world and what kind of people ought we to be. Notice in verse 11 through 14, it's the, the application of the truth of the day of the Lord that is coming. God's judgment is coming. Are we ready? Are we prepared? Are we telling others and so on? Peter is calling the church and the Spirit of God is calling us to wake up and not waste the short time that we have left, but to fulfill our purposes. So how are we doing? Are we thinking clearly? Are we standing firm or are we mocking and scoffing God's Word? Are we trusting that God is going to fulfill His promises? And in so prioritizing our lives accordingly. There's a second priority that I want us to, to look at in verses 8 through 10 in our time remaining this morning. Instead of being lulled to sleep, we should warn of God's work, not be weary. And so are we doing that? Are we warning of God's work? And, and I want us to see the, the work of God here. It's, it's not discouraging. It's encouraging. It is motivating. But, but notice God in this. I want us to see the character, the attributes of God. Instead of growing weary, instead of losing hope, because that is by nature who we are, we should be encouraged and motivated and reminded because of who cannot be is, it will encourage us to stay focused. We should warn of God's work and not be weary. Notice verse 8, but you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years like a day. So, notice verse 8, he is eternal and therefore... Because he is not constrained by time, he is under control. And that's what Peter wants to remind us of. He says, again, this theme of not forgetting. You must not forget this one thing. And, and then he talks about God being eternal. Here's that emphasis again. You see, knowing the truth isn't like riding a bike. Once you ride a bike, as, as everybody says, once you ride it, you, you can hop back on it even if you haven't rid, ridden the bike for like 10 years. You can get back on if you're physically able, you don't forget. But when it comes to the truth of God's Word, we easily forget. And so we have to constantly be reminded of what God has said. Notice the specific of this eternality. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord. God doesn't operate on our timing. He's eternal. He is sovereign. And so His plans look like He's forgot or lost control. But time doesn't define the Lord, and it doesn't direct His decisions. He will do what He wants when it's His perfect timing. And so this is comforting to us. It's also aggravating as human beings because we are so time-oriented, so linear. And so it is for a second to us. We, we lose patience in just a, a, a split second. But God is looking at eternity as a whole and so Peter is reminding us to think more like God and less like ourselves and let God's perfect plan unfold, which means that we should be patient. And so in verse 9, we see this. We, we should warn and tell others of God's work and not be weary because He's eternal and therefore under control. Verse 9, He's loving and therefore patient. Because God loves His creation... He doesn't want anyone to perish. He is patient. And that's why it looks slow to us. But God is saying, give me some time. Give those people time. I want people to come to faith in my son and be born again and redeemed. Notice, the Lord, this is one of these verses that we should memorize it because it reminds us so much about the character, the heart of God. The Lord isn't really slow about his promise as some people think. No. He is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. There's so much there in that, in that verse about who God is, about our role in telling others about salvation through faith in Christ, and, and that, that concept 
th those concepts there are so interesting. He is patient. Notice this, for your sake. I find that very interesting that, the, that God is patient. He's holding back His impending judgment that, that we see in, in verse 10. He's holding it back for your sake. And, and, and all I can conclude is that it's for the sake ultimately of all the elect, all of those that would at some point in time come to faith in Christ. Whether you come early or you come late, that He is holding it back, His judgment, so that as many as can come will come. Believe, repentance, turning from their unbelief to belief in a holy God by faith in Christ. He is loving. That's so important that we see this clearly. He is loving and therefore patient. Um, I, I think about this. You, you look at the nation of Israel. We talked about this earlier in our, in our worship time about um, in Nehemiah about Israel going into captivity. And then after a long period of time, they came out of captivity and Nehemiah led them and Ezra the priest was there. And, and they came back to enjoy once again the, the reading of God's Word, the worship of, of God. And, and Israel was always looking forward to God bringing them a king and restoring their kingdom. And it was never fulfilled the way they thought it should be fulfilled. And so when Jesus comes on the scene, the same again, the same attitude and mindset was there among the Jewish people. They grew impatient and they missed the most important part of God's plan. Because of God's patience, because of God's perfect plan, He sent His Son not to be the king, not to, to change everything and to, to get rid of all of the, the evil nations around them, but to go to the cross and take care of the most important need that all of us have, our need to have our sin dealt with. His Son dying on that cross, rising from the dead, that was God's plan. The nation of Israel missed that because they were impatient. They wanted restoration. They wanted a king. They didn't see that they needed a savior before they needed a king. And we too, if we're not careful, we can grow impatient and we can miss out on the best part of God's timing. To me, that comforts me. That, that challenges my own heart that because God is loving and patient and I am not, sometimes I catch myself going, God, would you just return would you just take care of this and, and me, all this, and so that we can be with you? And God graciously has reminded me, I still have a plan and a purpose. And I don't want to miss out on maybe some of the best moments and years of my life and the life of this church and the life of the body of Christ as a whole, of the great things that God wants to do if we would just trust Him and be patient and watch Him work and allow Him to work. And so we should warn of God's work because He's eternal, because He's loving. And then lastly, in verse 10, because He is faithful. He's faithful and therefore will fulfill His promised judgment. Judgment is coming. And so before it comes, we warn of God's work, of His ultimate Judgment. So here we come to the context of this whole passage about the day of the Lord. Notice in verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. It's unexpected to us, but it is the perfect timing for the Lord because God is faithful. And He's not just faithful in love and faithful in forgiveness and, and faithful in extending His mercy, but He is faithful in keeping His Word. And part of His Word is that He will judge sin. Now, He judged it at the cross. But we see throughout God's Word in the Old Testament, in, in the Gospels, and in the New Testament, we see very clearly that God says that there will be a day, a time of God's judgment uh, on the nations, the unbelievers that have rejected salvation through faith in Christ. And, and so we see this here in verse 10. The day of the Lord will come as a thief. It's unexpected. It's unpredictable. Only the Father knows. Uh, Jesus, as after He rose from the dead and right before He ascended, 
He was talking with the disciples, and, and this is what he said, because they were saying, is, is now the time to restore the kingdom? And, and Jesus' response in verse uh, 7 of Acts 1, he says, The Father alone has the authority to know when these things occur. They are not for you to know. And so it's going to come unexpectedly. But let's answer this question briefly. What is the day of the Lord? Well, there's a lot to this, and we don't have time to cover it all, but let me just cut to the chase. I believe, and I believe Scripture clearly teaches, as you study this out, that the day of the Lord is also described as the time of Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah 30 and verse 7 in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, and other passages that refer, especially in the Old Testament, to the time of Jacob's trouble or Israel's trouble. In the New Testament, in other passages, what we see is the time of Jacob's trouble is also referred to as the tribulation. Not tribulations or times of trial, but specifically to the seven-year tribulation that God will pour out judgment on the nations. The day of the Lord, the day is not an actual day. It's a period of time where God will fulfill His promised judgment. So we are living in the end times. We are living in the last days. But then the day of the Lord is different than the last days. It's like here the last days have, have come to an end. And now the day of judgment has come. And it's the beginning of another period of time. The seven year tribulation where God does pour out His judgment. Now, Jesus taught about this uh, day, this day of God's judgment in different passages. Matthew 24, again, you're going to have to look this up on your own and do some studying, and I would encourage you to do that because we're going to talk about this next week as well. Matthew 24, verses 36 through 42. Then Paul taught about the tribulation and the day of Jacob's trouble in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 through 11, and 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 through 17. And, of course, John wrote, um, he in Revelation, most, uh, all of Revelation, but he wrote about the tribulation in Revelation 6 through 19. And so there is much in the New Testament about the tribulation or Jacob's trouble. I want us to understand the difference here because notice what it says in verse 10, that the day of the Lord will come unexpectedly and the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire. So not judged by water as in the days of Noah, but with this new time of judgment where God will judge with fire and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. So the ultimate or the end of the, the day of the Lord is going to end where ultimately God will destroy the heavens and the earth and create a new heaven and a new earth. Now we, we see that mentioned in the end of Revelation. But understand the difference. The day of the Lord is not the rapture of the church. The day of the Lord is not the millennial kingdom. The day of the Lord is the tribulation time of seven years. Now, again, we're not going to get into the details because there's lots of different, different believers that love the Lord, that are going to be with the Lord for eternity, that have different views and differing views on this subject of the tribulation time. My intention is not to get into the, the details of eschatology today. My intention is to help us to understand that because God will judge the earth and he will bring judgment upon those that are unbelievers in that time. What type of people, how should we respond, how should we react, knowing what priority should we have, knowing that these things are going to come about? God is faithful to His promises. He is faithful to be a judge when He has to be a judge. And He will come. And the question is, are you ready? Is the world ready? Any moment, God uses things like we're going through today to remind us that we are not in control, that any moment in time, our life could be snuffed out, and so we have to answer this question, are we ready? Because God is eternal, because God is lovingly patient, and yet faithful to be that judge, what should our attitude toward Him and toward others be? Very simply, we need to trust Him. 
and we need to tell others. Next week, we will look at more details in verses 11 through 14 of how we should then live our lives, not only in telling others, because verse 9 clearly says, because of God's patience, we should go and tell others. But how should we then live our own lives? Should we waste our time? Or should we be about and have the priorities of God's business and His perfect plan for our life and the life of the church? You see, we have a perfect opportunity in these times in which we live to tell others about Him and that God would use these times to help people see their need of Jesus and that they would put their faith in Him. Are we willing to do that? Can you think of people that are, are your relatives or, or people in, at work or your neighbors, whoever it may be, that you know they don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ? They have not put their faith in Him. Could you start by praying for them? Could you pray for opportunities to go to them and talk to them? And that God has promised to give you the words to say that you can tell them that there's a day of judgment coming and we want you to be on the other side of that judgment, standing with Him as your Lord, not as, as the, the one that's going to judge you. And it's only by faith in Christ. And for any of you that are, are listening, that you are thinking about this and you know that you have not put your faith in Christ, that you would do that that you would deal with your sin and that you would turn to the one that has already dealt with it at the cross. Let's pray and then next week we'll pick it up right there in verse 11. Father, we thank you for your time, our reminders, there, and we thank you for your word and we just praise you for just these amazing reminders. Lord, we look forward to just the unfolding of your plan. But God, as we look and we see what part of your plan is, we see a devastation, we see destruction, we see fire purifying. And so God, we pray that in these last days before your judgment comes on the earth, God, would you help us to, to make sure that we are right with you and that we would be willing to sacrifice our own selfishness and our own insecurities and tell others that need to hear of Jesus that we would be willing to go and tell them. Father, that you would continue to be patient and that you would continue to draw people in repentance, in faith to your son Jesus for the forgiveness of sin and that we can see the church growing and multiplying and more and more, thousands and millions of people coming to faith in Christ before the day of the Lord. We give you the glory and the praise, and we look forward to that day when we will see you face to face. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.